Thanks, guys. How are you guys doing today? Good. Uh, family picnic this afternoon. Hope you guys are planning on coming back at four. We're going to have, I think I saw tons of watermelon in the, the thing. Who doesn't like watermelon, right? Well, I shouldn't ask that. Okay. Um, there will be derby car races. There's going to be just lots of fun for the family. Our whole goal in this is, is really to, to provide something for families to come and, and enjoy time together, to honor uh, uh, the, those who serve in the military. We'll have a, a parade of the Patriots, I think is what we call it. Uh, but it'll be a good time. So if you, if you can this afternoon, I invite you to come back for that. How are you guys doing again today? Better? Is it hot? I see some... It is hot. Well, maybe we can get the air kind of going a little bit faster. My name is Matt Dumas, and it's great to be with you guys this weekend. You know, in just a couple of weeks, it's going to be the Summer Olympics. Assuming that in Rio that we'll get everything kind of figured out, right? That, that all the athletes make it there. But the, the, the best athletes in the world, right? The, the, the guys and the gals are at the top of their game are going to go down to Rio and they're going to see who is the best of the best in their particular sport. And these guys and gals have spent hundreds, if not thousands of hours getting ready for those events. And for some of them, that event is going to last a brief moment of time. You know, when I was in high school, I was a sprinter. So I, I, I like guys like Hussein Bolt. You know, Hussein's going to uh, run again in the, in the 100 and all. And he's been working, again, hundreds if not thousands of hours, running races, trying to shave off fractions of a second of time. And all that for 10 seconds of glory. Now, for some of us, we'd go, man, that seems like a waste, right? All those hundreds and thousands of hours for that short, brief period of time. You know, if you were going to buy a house, I, I used to be uh, in the business world too. And the whole idea, uh, it's called return on investment. If I were going to buy a house today and sell it tomorrow, would I want the house to be worth more tomorrow or less? So you guys know the same thing I do, right? You want it to be worth more because if I sell it for more, then I made a profit. It was a good deal. If I sell it for less then it's a loss. It's a return on investment. And so, so sometimes that return on investment, it's in the eyes of the investor. They have to decide whether the return is worth the time that they invested. So for Hussein Bolt, when, when he gets there and I, and I were to ask him, is it worth it? I mean, all those hundreds and thousands of hours that you've spent training, is it worth it for 10 seconds? You know what he'd do? He'd hold up a gold medal and he'd say, I'm the fastest man on the planet. Absolutely, it was worth it. Now, we might look at that again, a, a huge investment for what seemingly is a small return, but today, as we continue our story in the book of Luke, we're going to see Jesus make this huge investment for what looks like a very small return as we continue our story with a sermon called Setting the Captive Free. Please turn to Luke chapter 8, and let's pray. Father, as Jim prayed earlier, we thank you for the freedom that we have to gather here today to, to worship you, for the time spent singing praise to your names, time spent celebrating baptisms and, and new life in Jesus, for the, the roses that are here on stage. And Father, now we come to a time where we want to hear from you, want to hear from your word. And I pray that, Father, you would give us ears to hear that your spirit would have freedom to move, that, that we would be drawn into what it is you want to call us to today. And Father, we think about the darkness around this world. We think about the terrorist attacks that have happened in Bangladesh and other places. Lord, we, we pray for families that are grieving today. We pray for uh, those who are ca held captive still in the enemy's hands I pray that this story would be a reminder that you are at work and that you have already won the victory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a look at verse 22. Now, on one of those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat, and he said to them, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out. But as they were sailing along, he fell asleep. And a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped and to be in danger. They came to Jesus and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. 
And he got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? Now, last time we were in the book of Luke, we talked about the parable of the soils. That the healthy plant that produces a good crop comes from soil where the seed is planted, and it takes root, and it bears a hundred times as much. And so the question is, what is the word producing in your life? What kind of produce do you have? Are you hearing what Jesus has to say and doing it? Sometime a little bit later, Jesus and his buddies decide to get in the boat. They're going to take a trip across the Sea of Galilee, the lake of Genesaret. It's an eight-mile voyage, and Jesus is exhausted. He is totally worn out. So much so that when he gets into the boat, as soon as he gets into the boat, what happens? He falls asleep. And Jesus, as he's sleeping, all of a sudden this, this hurricane force wind comes racing across the top of the water and slams into the boat. And the wind and the waves began to crash against the boat. And the water began spilling into the boat. You see, the, uh, the lake of Genesaret, the Sea of Galilee, is about 700 feet below sea level. It's surrounded by mountains with deep ravines. And so uh, you guys that are weather people know when cold and warm air hits each other, there can be flash storms that come up in a minute, in, in a moment. And that's what happens in this area. It's very susceptible to that. That the, the quiet lake can become a raging sea in, in just a second. So the disciples are understandably frightened. That's probably an understatement as they see, you know, the, the, the storm raging around them, the waters rising, they feel like they're sinking. It reminds me of, I don't know, you guys have seen those movies where there's a storm at sea, uh, like we saw the other day, The Finest Hours or uh, Moby Dick or, or, or The Perfect Storm. You guys know what I'm talking about? Some of you know about the three-hour tour, right, that set out. <laughs> Gilgan's Island, right? They got stranded. Or even Old Testament, think of Jonah, right? When they set out on the boat and he's being uh, disobedient to God and a huge storm comes up while well, the prophet's sleeping. Well, Jesus is dead asleep while the guys are freaking out. And so they do what any of us would have done. They, they run up to Jesus, they go, Master, Master, wake up! Now, I don't know what they're expecting. What was Jesus occupation before he became a traveling teacher? Carpenters don't know a whole lot about sailing, do they? Right? That's not your, your go-to sailor is not the carpenter. These are all fishermen, and yet they're, they're coming to Jesus, wake up! Why is that? Because they know that Jesus will think of something. That he can do something. They don't know yet what or maybe they just don't like the fact that he's sleeping and they're freaked out, right? <laughs> but in that moment, they're calling for Jesus. And so Jesus wakes up. And he looks and, and he sees the, the waves and he, see, he feels the wind on his face, the water slapping against him. And he is unmoved. He just says, peace be still, right? He says, calm down. And I can't imagine what that's like, right? I don't know if you have been in any kind of a vessel in water, even when there's not a storm and it's kind of going up and down like this. But huge waves that would be crashing, throwing the boat up and down, fearing for your life, thinking the boat's about to break, and then all of a sudden completely calm. And so Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves, and then he turns and he rebukes his disciples and he says, where is your faith? You go, huh? Wait a minute. This isn't about faith. This is, there's a storm here. This is about to break up the boat. Why are you talking about faith when this is, a, this is a terrifying episode? Remember that Jesus had said to them, storms in life will come. That wasn't an accident that he said storms in life will come because where do they find themselves right now? In a literal storm. 
And Jesus said that there's two kind of houses in those, in this, when the storms come. The house that is built without a foundation and the house with a foundation. What happens to the house without a foundation? Destroyed. It's only the house with the foundation that stands. It's only the person who hears Jesus' words and does them that lasts through the storm. And when he switches the, 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 the picture, he, he down, then talks about, remember, we had the good soil over here. And he says that the, the seed, the, the word of God, goes down deep into that soil. And, and it holds fast to the seed. And then it bears fruit with perseverance. That when the storms come, the person who bears good fruit is the one who holds on. And so Jesus here isn't talking about saving faith. He's not talking about uh, where's your faith in that you have to believe in me to, to get to go to heaven. He's talking about a believer's faith. It's faith applied under pressure when the storms come. Where is your faith? Is your faith in Jesus that he can rescue you from the storm? Or are you trusting in yourself? Now these guys, <laughs> you can imagine they're going, who is this? I mean, they just saw him passed out in the boat. He's totally exhausted. That tells us he's a man. And yet, what man can speak to the wind and the waves and it becomes totally calm? See, that's something only God can do. In the Old Testament, God was the one who calmed the storms. God was the one who, who tamed the raging seas. That God was the one who was control over creation. And Luke reminds us once again that Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. Right? That he is the, the one perfect son of God. And this storm, the calming of the storm, is, a, is creation's testimony to who Jesus is. That he is both creator and sustainer. Storms are a part of the process of spiritual growth. Storms are going to come. As a believer, you know that. Storms come in our life. They're the opportunity for us to experience God's grace at deeper levels when they come. But like Jesus said, there's some folks who weather the storm well, and there's others who don't. So how can I weather the storm well? Here it is. I have to believe at the most fundamental level of who I am, that God is good and that he loves me. Right? If I've trusted in Jesus, I've got to believe that God is good and that he loves me and that he is a good father who wants what's good for his kids. Right? That he desires our good and he delights in us. I have to believe that at the deepest level of who I am so that when the storms come, and they will come, I'm not rattled. And I also have to believe that God is in complete control no matter the disaster. Do y'all believe that? I'm not sure we always believe that. I think many times we think God's lost control. That he can't help us in this storm. You don't understand what I'm going through. God can't help me in this storm. But unless I believe that God is good, that he loves me, and that he's in control, then whenever the storm comes, I'm going to be shaken and torn apart. I won't trust him. But if I believe at the most fundamental level of who I am, and where does that come from? I have to spend time in his word, right? I have to hide his word deep in my heart so that when the storms come, there's a reservoir of, uh, of truth that I can pull from. There's a reservoir of truth that I can pull out and I can say, okay, when the enemy tells me that it's hopeless, this situation is dire and there's no rescue, I can say, no, that's not true. I have a father who loves me, who delights in me and desires my good. And no matter what this storm is, what was Jesus doing in the storm? He wasn't freaked out, was he? 
that Jesus isn't freaked out in the storms in our life, even though he's there with us in the boat. He calms the storm with a word, and it's a reminder that he is the one who is sovereign over the challenges and the circumstances of our lives. That he alone is the one who has authority over all of creation. That Jesus is with us in the midst of the storm. He is right there. And sometimes he delivers us from the storm. But I don't know about you. I find most of the time it's not from, but it's through. And when you're going through that storm, that's when you have to believe. And you have to trust. And you hold on with perseverance, to bear fruit. And so what storms today is Jesus taking you through that you need to trust him to rescue you? Let's take a look at verse 26. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he came out, of the, out onto the land, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons and who had not put on any clothing for a long time, and was not living in a house but in the tombs. Seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him, and said in a loud voice, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles, and kept under guard. And yet he would break his, his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. Now there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountain. And the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine. And he gave them permission. And the demons came out of the man and entered the swine. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake. And was drowned. So after crossing the Sea of Galilee and calming the storm, Jesus and his buddies get to the land of the Gerasenes. It's the first time in the book of Luke that Jesus will be in Gentile territory. So as he steps out of the boat, he is now in Gentile land. And he's met by a guy from the city. And we have to stop there. What do we know about this guy? We know that he is a pawn in this cosmic spiritual battle. That he's possessed by demons. And that colors everything else that we know about this man. From his choice of living accommodations, to his incredible strength, to his unpleasant and destructive behavior. Everything we know about him is colored by the fact that he is possessed by demons. Not just one, but many demons. That he is a terror to himself and others. That even being alive, he's consigned to the land of the dead. That he roams about the tombs, naked, with chains and shackles. As Luke describes it, it sounds more like an animal. A ferocious animal than it does a man. And oh, one other thing we know about this guy. And this is the most important thing. If you get nothing else, this is the most important thing. Jesus crossed the sea for this one man. That's pretty incredible. That Jesus will go through all that we're about to talk about for one man. Now, how do I know that? Because after this encounter with this one man, he gets back in his boat. He goes across the other side. Jesus will do all of this for one man. Hussein Bolt would hope a gold medal and say, yes, it's worth it to be the fastest man on the planet. Jesus would say, yes, it's worth it to save one soul. That's the best thing. I can tell you about this man right now. Now, according to the Old Testament, almost everything about this guy is unclean. We're already told he's, he's possessed by an unclean demon, so there's number one. Where does he live again? 
and the tombs where who live? Dead people, which would make him unclean. He's in Gentile territory, which, by the way, unclean. And there's some pig farmers in the area. Anything wrong with pigs? I like bacon. But they're unclean, right? Everything about this man is unclean. But we know what happens when Jesus encounters the unclean, don't we? We've seen it before. Jesus makes the unclean clean. It needs to be said, demons are real. This story is not just a metaphor for a guy who's having a really bad day. And we may not have a category for it in our day-to-day life about demon or demonic possession. We may not want to even think about that. It's okay. The demons, I mean, the, oof, the townsfolk didn't want to either. They put the guy in the tombs. They, they hid him away so they didn't have to think about it or talk about it. But both Peter and Paul tell us it's a reality. In fact, Paul says that our, our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But it's against the powers, the rulers, rulers, the world forces of this darkness. Against the spiritual forces of wickedness. Where? In the heavenly places. There's real spiritual warfare that goes on. And if I were to talk to each and every one of you, you would be able to tell me about supernatural things that you couldn't explain. Demons are real. And it's interesting... How intent they are on keeping Jesus from coming into the region. If you think about it, they, this storm has this kind of a de- demonic force to it. And then as soon as he gets there, a man comes up to, to, to meet them who's able to break chains. Can you imagine what the disciples are thinking, right? You just had this storm kind of throwing you all over the place, and then this crazy guy, naked with chains, ch ch coming at you. I mean, that would be pretty freaky. So they're, they're, you know, they're there, and this is, uh, as Jesus gets there, this isn't the place you come for vacation, right? You don't have timeshares here. You don't plan an over to, uh, a holiday to go visit the area and just see what the garrisons are like. This was not a place you went. And yet Jesus chooses that spot to land. Jesus chooses that day to be there. That Jesus goes there and for the first time ever with this demoniac, his terrifying rampage doesn't prevail. And when the demoniac meets the divine, there's only one winner, right? Jesus clearly wins. And so Jesus asks the man, the demoniac, he says, what is your name? And the demoniac says, legion. The Roman legion was the largest military unit in the Roman army. It was 6,000 soldiers strong. And so when he says legion, it gives us kind of a military flavor to what this demon, uh, these demons have in mind. The, the, the number and the power and the intention they have with this man. Nevertheless, they offer no challenge to Jesus. That Jesus is clearly in control. That with a word, he, he calms the physical storm. And with a word, the spiritual storm is likewise done away with. That Jesus not only has the authority over the winds and the waves, he has authority over demons as well. You can imagine the disciples again. Who is this man? The most significant part of the interchange between the demoniac and Jesus happens when the demoniac calls him son of the most high God. You see, in the Old Testament, the most high God, God most high, was was a reminder to Israel that Israel's God was in a category of his own. 
That there was no God like Israel's God. That all of the so-called gods of the nations were nothing. They were wood and stone and metal. That he alone had all authority and power and strength and might and dominion and everything that is named. He alone is creator God and there is none like him. And so when the demons recognize you're the son of the most high God, they recognize Jesus' unique relationship to God Almighty. And not only his unique relationship, but his, his unquestioned power to do what Jesus does. Enter the pigs. The demons beg permission to be sent into them. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems like a little bit of an odd request. Why the pigs? And the pigs, once the demons enter them, they go running down the hill and into the water. And you go, why did they have to die? I don't know. Maybe you guys don't have that question. But I wonder, why Why did the demons choose the pigs? Why did the pigs run into the water? And why was Jesus okay with that? That's a lot of bacon. (laughs) Pork futures are down. And we're not told why the demons want to go in there, right? We're not told why they choose the pigs. There's lots of theories why they might have. We're sure that Jesus wouldn't have said, okay, you can go into the pig farmers. But we don't know exactly why they chose the pigs. But here's the thing we do know, that that, that Luke uh, wants us to see that this, this awesome display of Jesus' command, his ability that with a word, there's no doubt from the people who are watching, and from the man himself, the extent of the deliverance, right? Especially when we find out how large a herd this group of pigs were. Now, why the pigs ran into the sea, we don't know. Sorry if you were waiting for that one. But here's the thing. Why was Jesus okay with it? And why was he okay with 2,000 pigs, Mark tells us, being destroyed? Why was he okay with the, with the financial loss that would have been for their owners? This would have been an economic catastrophe for the region. Why would Jesus be okay with it? I mean, yay for the guy, right? He's, he's, he, he has this huge deliverance, but not so good for the pigs. Pigs are gone. And ironically, neither Luke nor Jesus feel the need to talk about the obvious plight of the pigs. Not a word spoken. That our undivided attention is directed to the rescue of one man from this treacherous and tragic fate. That Jesus wants us to see that rescuing one person One person who bears the image of God. Restoring that person is more valuable than how many of her pigs. Right? For Jesus to rescue one, right? Later on, we're going to find out when Jesus talks about the the Pharisees and how if they have a hundred sheep and there's 99 and one gets lost, how they'll go to the greatest lengths to save one sheep. He'll say, my father in heaven does that for people, right? That he will go to whatever extents to save one, right? There's rejoicing in heaven when only one, if that's all there is. And so, in this one, even though it's a great loss of prime pork, it's not worth mentioning. Let's take a look at verse 34. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran away and reported it in the city and out in the country. The people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they became frightened. 
Those who had seen it reported to them how the man who was demon-possessed had been made well. And all the people of the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked him to leave them, for they were gripped with great fear. And he got into a boat and returned. So first the disciples are kind of freaked out. Now it's the herdsman's turn. Herdsman's term. Turn, sorry. And we, can, we know why, right? They had seen this guy who was, was demon-possessed with multiple demons, who, who was acting crazy, and all of a sudden now it's their pigs that are acting crazy. And then not only are the pigs acting crazy, they're running down into the water. So they go and they tell the townsfolk, and the townsfolk come out to see what has happened to the man and to the pigs. And when they see the man sitting there, right? Total reversal where he was before. Before he was, he was ranting, he was out of his mind. Before he was naked, before he was running about the tombs, they see him sitting clothed in his right mind, listening to Jesus. They're terrified. They don't have a category for it. And when they find out about the pigs, enough's enough. And they beg Jesus then to leave. You see, the townsfolk, they couldn't help the man. And so what they did was they saw the man as a problem and not as a person. So they decided to put the man over in a place where he wouldn't be a problem for everybody else. That they were really unmerciful to this guy. But Jesus, right, who had the power and the authority, Jesus who, who crossed the sea, Jesus was willing to pursue this guy. And he cast the demons out of the man. He doesn't cast the man out. Jesus saw the man, the person, instead of the problem. And so Jesus rescues this man, and, and the townsfolk at that moment, they don't know what to do with that. Unfortunately, they didn't see their own need for rescue. Let's look at verse 38. But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him but he sent him away saying, return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. The story ends with the former demoniac asking to be with Jesus. The townsfolk beg Jesus to, to leave and so he's going to honor that request. He gets in the boat about to head out and this one man runs back and he begs Jesus to allow him to go with him. Just like Simon and Levi, who left everything to follow Jesus. Now this man wants to follow Jesus. He wants to be with him. And Jesus says, i got a different job for you. You don't get to go with me right now. I've got a different job for you. I want you to go home. And I want you to tell what great things God has done for you. I want you to be a witness to me at home. Now we might say, and as we're talking about our impact list, that Jesus is saying, I want you to go to your friends and your neighbors. I want you to go to your, your family. I want you to go to your workmates or your teammates or your classmates. I want you to go to the guy, when you talk to the guy at the gym or wherever you are, whoever those play, people are around you, tell what great things God has done for you. Because you see, this guy had a story to tell. It was a story of God's rescue of him. It was a story of God's mercy and of God's compassion and of God's grace in his life. The townsfolk had a story too, but theirs was of bitterness and loss and regret. Now it's interesting, from a numbers perspective, this was not a very successful journey. Jesus goes through all of that and there's only one man. There's only one man. And that one man will be the guy who's supposed to testify to Jesus when he leaves. So Jesus gets in a boat, and he's going to head back across. It's interesting, though, when Jesus later in the, Luke of Gos uh, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, when the disciples come into this area again, and when Jesus shows up, guess what happens? The crowds flock to him. Why do you think that is? Because of one man, right, who had a story to tell. And Jesus said, go out proclaiming it, preaching 
the good things that God has done for you. And when he does, then God uses that. You see, Jesus had radically changed this guy's life. He had taken him from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light in a very, very dramatic and and visible way. Jesus had rescued him. Just like he rescued the disciples. And just like he rescues us. Having crossed the sea and tamed the st- raging storm that was there. And he, he, Jesus encounters a man with a raging storm within him. And both of them, Jesus with a word, calms the storm. And, and we could easily say, well, the whole point of the story is Jesus has power over the natural and the supernatural world. That he's, he's got authority over all these things. And he does. He does have power over those things. But this is a story about the rescue of one man. Right? That Jesus crosses this storm-tossed sea. That he faces down the hordes of hell for one man. That's a pretty incredible story. Lots of different characters in this, this one. And I don't know where you fit within those characters. I don't know which one you align with. Maybe you're like the demoniac. And maybe you feel so far from God that that, that you think there's no hope of ever being rescued. Maybe everyone's given up on you because they say you're too far gone. Maybe that's where you are today. And you need to be, you need to hear that Jesus is willing to go through whatever links to rescue you. And that he can rescue you. And maybe that's your story, and and now you've got a story you need to be telling other folks. Maybe you've been rescued by Jesus, and you need to be proclaiming that. You need to be reminded of what great things God has done for you. Or maybe you're like the disciples who who, who are... uh, in the midst of a storm right now and, and the ship is breaking apart and you don't know what else to do. You've lost kind of your way and you're, you're wondering if Jesus knows or cares that, that life is falling apart for you. And you need to be reminded that Jesus is there with you and that he will see you through. He's not freaked out by the storm because he knows the ending already. There's another group that he includes in this, though, the townsfolk. They're a different kind of twist because they're unbelievers at this time. But I think there is a rebuke, though, for those of us who value things over people. Our biggest concern is, what about the pigs? Right? When our first question is, how could this huge waste for one person, that's really not worth it. But for Jesus, yes, it is. It's worth it every time. And so whether you are a frightened disciple trying to weather the storm or a frightful demoniac who needs to be rescued and and brought into the kingdom of light or whether you're a fearful townsfolk who values possessions over people who doesn't want Jesus to change anything. Jesus came to rescue you. He's still on a mission to pull people out of the fires of hell. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this another reminder of your incredible love for us. We know that that Jesus is the reflection of of you and that you are a good, good Father. And that just as you, uh, just as you, Jesus, were willing to go through all of this seeming effort for one man, so each of us who have trusted in you have a similar story of how you've rescued us when we were far from you, when we were enemies.
And I pray that you would remind us of that, that that story would never get old for us and it would be one that we are constantly proclaiming. Telling folks what great things you've done for us. And Father, I know that there are folks in this room today who are in the midst of a storm right now that feels like it's ripping their lives apart. And they're wondering, they're lost at sea, they can't see the shore, they're wondering if you even care. I pray that they would be reminded that you are a good, good father. One who loves them deeply, who delights in them as your children, who desires their good. And whether it's disobedience, whether it's disaster, whether it's It feels like the total destruction of their lives, that, Father, that you are there, that Jesus never leaves their side. He's just not freaked out by the things that freak us out. Help us to know that peace that passes understanding, that in the midst of the storm, we could sit there with Jesus. I know it's going to be okay. And Father, for those like the town's folks, who see people as problems, who see their stuff as more important, who want to keep you at a distance because you change things too much. I pray that you'd break down those walls. I pray that you would plow up the soil of their hearts. I pray that you would remove the the hardness, the rocks, the, the weeds. I pray that you prepare good soil. that they could rejoice in the links that you would go to to save one person. We love you. Pray these things in Jesus' name.